We are running a few minutes late, so we should get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Douglas Bernal, um, talking about the current neural networks. Um, enjoy his talk. Yeah. And thank you. Um, that, that's enough introduction, so I'll just go to the first demo, um, which is using a recurrent neural network to um, read the kernel kit logs and generate new patches. Um, so it's using a, a modified form of um, the git log, slightly different than what you get from git log minus p, you get um, a c the commit line, which I've, I've taken off on this side, and, and um, because the commit number is a, is a random string, and a recurrent neural network can't learn to predict that. Um, at the moment, its output has <laughs> just started reading, and, and it's predicting that that would be a good patch, which um, it'll gradually get better over time. Um, and I've taken out the merge messages, and I've taken out the um, author and the date, because um, if it generates a good patch, then that would be a lie, um, because the author would be me. Um, so, and for the same reason, I've also taken, taken out the signed off by in the CC lines. So it ends up with something like this, and it's going to try and learn... Um, while you're listening, it's going to try and learn to generate patches. It probably won't succeed because it's just a small net. Um, anyway, and while I was doing that, over here, it's getting better. Um, I was talking about what a recurrent neural network is. Um, but first, I'll talk about what a neural network is because it's kind of like the basis. Um, so this simple neuron that almost everyone uses that looks like this. Um, the numbers come in from somewhere, and you try to make up some sense of them. They're multiplied by weights, and they all get added together, and then they get put through a nonlinear function, which does some magic. And that the bias is another number that comes in. Um, in practical terms, uh, it's easy to think of the bias as just another weight where the input is always a 1. Um, then you just put it on the end of your, your array. So if you had a neuron that was trying to decide whether something was a cat, and the three inputs were its fluffiness, how dark it was, and whether it was barking, um, being fluffy would be a, probably have a slightly positive weight. But, but, you know, it's not definitive. Um, how dark it is, there's maybe more black cats than white cats, though there's a lot of ginger cats, so it's, it has almost no meaning. Um, and if it's barking, it's probably not a cat. Um, so if these were your features, that, would be, that, that might be the weight set you'd use to decide whether it was a cat. And that's, that's all a, a neuron is, is... is adding things up and then munging them at the end, which I'll get to. Um, now, if you have the same features and you have two neurons, and one of them is trying to decide whether it's a sea lion, then the barking is a, um, it's a positive thing there. So then, um, the, then if you compare the outputs for cat and sea lion, if it's barking, it's definitely a sea lion, definitely not a cat. But if it's not, then it's just sort of based on the other one, so you, it's hard to be sure, because they're both neither black nor white. Um, now, in a neural network, you just have lots of these neurons, and the, typically the um, inputs that how fluffy it is, how dark it is, and so on. They come from a previous layer. So this is showing another layer. Something down here, these neurons are working out the features that go into this layer. And 
you just add all these layers up. And the conventional way to draw this is to draw them so that the inputs go at the bottom and then the output comes at the top. And the reason for that, I think, I mean, the good thing about that is you can say that the top ones talk about high-level features and the bottom ones talk about low-level features and it makes sense. Um, though it goes against the flow of text and everything. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start using the, the diagrams towards the, the, the right-hand side because drawing all the little bits is hard and it's getting more abstract. So in the old days, like 10 years ago, five years ago, um, a neural network usually meant what was called a multi-layer perceptron, um, which <laughs> meant a two-layer perceptron. In, in neural ne network language, multi means two. Um, or, or, or you can count it as three um, if you count the input layer, or you can count it as one if you just count the hidden layers. The input layer is just a, an array, a row of numbers. So, um, you don't really need to count it. And a deep neural network, which um, is all the rage these days, just has more layers in the middle. If you've got more than two layers, it's deep. If you've got two layers, it's multi. Um, I'll just have a look and see how that's going on. So, uh, hang on. That's what I want to do. Yeah, it's, it's a bit bigger and easier to see. Um, so now it's trying to generate patches, and uh, all the lines where it's got a minus at the beginning, they look like good things, but where it's got a plus, it's not doing so well. Um, a recurrent neural network is a neural network where the inputs from the, the, you know, the hidden um, layer from the previous generation comes around and goes in as extra inputs. And, um, now, I won't try to explain that picture because it's, it's impossible. I'll just go to this one, um, which is that one unfolded, unfolded in time. So time flows this way, information flows that way, um, so the hidden layers, they feed up themselves up that way. Um, and the inputs keep coming in, the outputs keep coming out. Um, and that's, that's the, you know, the basic simple recurrent neural network. And fr from now on I'm going to start using this kind of picture. Because it's easier to draw. Um, now the training sequence for a neural network is you start off with random weights, um, usually special random weights, but they're just random. Um, you take, take some training examples and you just see how, see what the neural network gives you. And then you adjust the weights slightly to make that better. Um, so here, here it is with an ordinary neural network or deep one. The minus is showing you take the, the difference between the two of them and then you work out how to change the weights to make that, that difference smaller, to make it closer to the right answer. Um, and that, those arrows poking into the blue lines, that's, that's representing the weight arrays. Um, with a recurrent neural network, the, um, it's ba the current answer is based on all the inputs right back to the beginning of time. 
Um, so you, you have to ch change the weights um, all the way back to the beginning of time. Now, because they actually, it's just the same weight array. It's only one set of weights, so it's those purple ones. It's not, so all those lines actually represent the same weight array. So you have to work out what you need to change and then add them all together. Um, and now if you go back to the beginning, that can be a long, long time. So usually people truncate it. Um, so in this case, it's going back 30 generations. So it's learning. Um, from 30 characters before. Now, there's something I forgot to say about this one. Um, the, this, is, this is reading the characters one at a time and predicting the next character. And that's how it's generated. And that's what it's learning to do. Um, so, these numbers here, these are measures of entropy. The V stands for validation entropy and the T is the training entropy. So the T is the stuff it's reading as it, as it, that it's training on and the, the V ones are things it has never seen, only sees when it's been tested. Um, which gives you a more valid view. Um, so what it's doing is it's reading the text and it guesses what the next character is and then it sees what the next character is and the difference between what it guesses and what it sees um, is, is the error and then it has to, has to um, learn to... It has to learn to minimise that. Okay. So now the, the, I'll talk about this nonlinear function that you have at the end of new, your neuron. If you don't have it there, then all those layers. I won't go into the maths, but they all collapse into one because you're multiplying by a whole series of matrices, matrices. And if you do that and there's no nonlinearity, it's just like doing one matrix. Um, if you have a nonlinearity, then it actually has to do something more complex and it can't collapse. Um, and one of the things you do when you're training is you multiply the training sample by training the value by the um, slope of the number that you got from your nonlinear fa function. So, um, traditionally these top ones were used, the logistic and the hyperbolic tangent, and they have a nice um, feature whereby they, they, they squash numbers down. So in a recurrent um, neural network, because you're multiplying by the same matrix forever and ever and ever. Now, it's like multiplying by number. If you multiply by a number slightly bigger than one, if you raise it to the power of a, a zillion, it, it um, overflows your floating point. Um, so if, if, you, if, the, if the matrix works out to be multiplying by, by, to be amplifying the signal over and over and over again, you, it, it blows up. Um, if it's just reducing it slightly, um, that works well um, because the new signal is coming in from the inputs. But there are times when it, it goes out of control and starts to blow up. Um, and these squashing functions, they help with that. But it has been found in, um, in deep neural network research that the, this simple one here, the, it's called Brillo or rectified linear unit. Um, 
it, it works much better. It drains better, it's faster, because you're multiplying by the slope, and the slope of that is always is 1 when it's going up like that. And there's a simple way of multiplying by 1 where you do nothing. And then, or, or it's 0, and it's even simpler than doing nothing to multiply by 0, because you do not even anything to work out what you're going to multiply. Um, so you can skip that calculation. And I've started using this rectified square root. I've actually got the wrong number, the wrong calculation there. Um, never mind. So how I, ca how I came across these things is um, I had to do an artwork in the an art gallery in, in Dunedin in the South Island um, and I promised them that I'd make something that would listen to what people were saying and modify um, the video in response to what they were talking about and if you saw me talking in Canberra I was talking about in 2013 I was talking about um, speech recognition and all kinds of things like that. Trying to get a New Zealand accent to be recognised by a speech recogniser. Uh, um, I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, and I couldn't do it and I was running out of time to do this show. Um, but on the way I read a, uh, the, this man, Thomas Mikhailov, I probably say it wrong, um, He'd, he'd used a recurrent neural network to make a language model, which is something that is, is used in, um, in speech recognition to model the flow of language. And that's um, just what this thing here is doing. It's modeling the flow of a patch. Um, and then I thought I could make an artwork that used... Um, recurrent neural networks directly on the audio and the video on a video stream um, that would do the, have the same effect to the art gallery as as the thing I'd put, I'd said I'd do. So that's why I got into them. But I'll, I'll go into language models first. So with a um, word-based language model, your inputs. Uh, um, words and, and they have an index into the input array and the outputs are words too and it just you tell it what the word is the next word and it guesses the word after that and then you tell it the word next word and it, it keeps just guessing the word and the way it guesses is it, it makes a probability of how of how those words will be, and then when you s you can sample from it to generate um, like nonsense like this. By if you imagine you turn turn that bar chart into a pie graph um, and throw a dart at it as if you're playing darts, then you're picking a, a word from that probability. Um, now, if you don't <laughs> A word-based language model, there are thousands of words, and that makes your arrays very large. It makes it slow to learn, and it makes the input... Well, the input... Um, I'll talk about that. Um, the input array... The blue line is a matrix of weights. The, the array is a single one and the rest are zeros. And so that's the same as just feeding that one array in as the input, which is assigning a vector to each word. Um, now, if you've heard, you might have heard about a program called Word2Vec, 
which Google have written, which um, they calculate a vector for each word, and then they can do arithmetic on those vectors and they find relationships between the words. It's actually the same guy who, his PhD, Mikhailov, his PhD was in these recurrent neural networks, and then he went on to do the word to vec. So it's, it's actually a related concept. So they learn, they learn to output the right <laughs> vectors that when they go into this recurrent neural network, um, they'll predict the next word. And, and, the, and what I am doing here is just doing it character by character. So if I scroll up. Um, I don't know if you can see. These are the characters it's using. And then these ones here are the ones it's ignoring and it's just mapping them onto the um, carrot carrot. Okay. So that, this um, entropy number as, as Shannon in, cross entropy um, Shannon cross entropy is telling you how much the how much information the model misses um, and it should be going down it's, it's going down it's not going down very fast anymore um, And the, the estimates of the, the, the entropy of, of Britain English go back to Shannon in 1950. He estimated that there was between um, 0.6 and 1.3 bits of entropy in written English. And actually, nobody's made any good advance on that. That's, um, except that I think it's, it's more generally accepted that it's... Um, the entropy in English depends on who's who's writing, who's reading, and you know the context. Um, but I've used it uh, actually for this bit. Um, if you if you're live tweeting, um, and if you're a New Zealander and you know what this is about, just um, please stop for a bit and and do something else with your hands. Or um, be vague. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. Um, so th there was a, there's a scandal, a recent scandal, um, where there's a an attack blogger would post posts that um, attacked health researchers, or mainly health researchers, or, or just kind of random people. And no one could quite work out why, um, except they thought he was nasty. Um, but in fact, he, he was being paid by a, a PR man to um, getting sent these posts. I've changed the names. Um, to, um, to attack various people, you know, being paid by the tobacco, the alcohol, in those kind of companies to attack people who were trying to regulate tobacco and alcohol um, or just studying it um, and then through other channels um, the same PR people would would you know feed friendlier stories and so now nobody knew this was happening except that somebody hacked the blogger's computer and these emails were found that from the from the PR man to the blogger with a post that was to be posted the next day. Um, but only a few of the emails were found. So there are more the theory is there are more of these posts have been posted. There's you know several a day for several years. Um, so, I tagged 
Now, if, if you if you run this through a um, character model, a uh, language model, what it would co focus on is the names and the topics, because those are good indicators. If you try to work out the authorship, that's what that's what would be the indicators of authorship. That is that it's talking about alcohol or it's talking about tobacco. Um, so I used the part of speech tagging to replace those the nouns and verbs that are content words and, and adverbs. All the content, well, not all of the content, as many content words as I could find. I, I made a white list of various parts of speech because words like is is a verb and you don't want to replace that. Um, so that, by combining those two and using Armenian characters as tokens, um, I made a stream of contentless text that represented these blogs. And then training every current neural network on the bloggers post, which are the grey dots, and then the, on the another one on the PR man's posts, and then subtracting the cross entropy between the two of them. Entropy is, is nice in that you can add it up and subtract it. Um, then the difference, um, the ones slower down are more like the were well, the better modelled by the model that was trained on the PR man, and the ones up the top uh, are better modelled by the blogger, or the, at least by the ones that are unknown, unrecognised, because nobody really knows who's, who wrote the grey dots. And and the other colours are other people who are also up to mischief. Um, now, the, this was quite, was quite... It's not very good, because the, there weren't enough uh, posts to train the model to um, recognise... There weren't enough PR man posts, um, so it's a it's a very um, wonky model. It's like a, it's worse than this one, which has been only training for twenty thirty minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll actually, I'll stop doing that, um, and let's just see if we can make a post. Make a a patch. Well, that's that's not a very good patch. <laughs> um, it doesn't really have a proper header, but you you can see it. it it's kind of getting the context of you take things out, put things in. It, it's that when it when it's speaking English, it stays speaking English for a while, and then it. Sometimes it ends with a comment, uh, comment in You need to know C and patch language to, to see that it's bad. <laughs> um, but so if, if it was bigger and it was trained for longer, it would do better, but it wouldn't really do all that good. Um, they start doing things like they start balancing uh, the parentheses so it knows that it's opened one up and needs to finish it and that, that kind of thing. Um, so, right, that's one thing. There's some things you can do with a recurrent neural network. This is one. This is another. Um, this is actually another way of looking at it. It wasn't a recurrent neural network, which kind of confirms that the, the two models confirm each other even though they're using a completely different system. So. If I can make a big enough um, model of patches from the, the Linux kernel, I'm aiming for this. <laughs> and actually, while I was looking for that, I found this this quote of the week um, talking about software pro <laughs> replacing driver developers. But anyway, so as uh, I've got till 25 past, is that right? Um, 
this, this show into Needham, I needed to make an artwork that made video that responded to audio. Um, that's what I told them I'd do. So I made a recurrent neural network that watched video and listened to the audio and fed them both into a and they, they fed into the recurrent neural network and they were supposed to learn to take the pr previous frame and make a higher resolution version of it. Um, they take the previous frame and the a surrounding set of frames and the reason they do that is um, I applied it recursively so as well as being recurrent it was recursive and so it makes an overall picture that predicts the higher resolution version and that is used to predict the next one up um, I can't well, one of the one of the reasons I didn't just make it take the whole frame in high resolution and go through and put out a whole another whole frame is it's just too it have to be too big. Um, I, I'll do the demo of that one. Um, so this is it. It's watching a Louis, Louis Thoreau video. Um, starting to learn how the video moves. And it's trying to produce video that moves in the in the same way. Um, now it ran for four months, um, and it didn't get better than this because I had bugs in it because I had you know five minutes to finish it. Um, but now, if it ran for four months, it would get better than this. <laughs> um, I, I had to put in all kinds of checks to make sure the, the numbers never got to infinity. If, if you're dealing with matrices that are multiplying them themselves by themselves, if they, if one of the, if one number touches infinity, then your whole thing turns to infinity, and the, that's over. And and it was screwed to the ceiling, and I couldn't, I could I was in a different city, so I couldn't um, go back and check on it. So I just had to leave it. So. And we'll do for that one. Um, then I did another one, where which uh, you, you've heard of a cellular automaton, like the Game of Life. Um, now this one watches the video, and it learns how each pixel changes in relation to its neighbours over time, and. So right at the beginning, it's actually not very much like real life. But this one does. If you run it for long enough, it starts making things that look sort of um, like a Louis Thoreau video on, um, in the fine detail, but they don't have, it doesn't have the overview, which the other one had... Um, because of that recursive character, it, it had a structure of the whole thing sort of look realistic if it kept going. Um, another thing I've done some of is audio classification. Uh, so this is a GStreamer plugin. Those last two were GStreamer plugins too. Um, to train it up. I feed it a whole lot of audio files and tell it what class the audio file belongs to at each point in time. Um, um, like 200 at a time. Now the reason I do 200 at a time is an, an ordinary um, neural network training you use stochastic gradient descent which the, the stochastic just means you throw the examples in a random order. With a recurrent neural network, you, you can't really throw out examples in a random order because the order is the whole point. Um, so unless your class is changing at every point, which is the case in the character 
um, production thing. You, you know, it doesn't go a a a a. It just changes. Um, then you need you need to. If you just train it on one file, it'll get trained all the way over to one class, and then it'll the next file will train it all the way back the other way, and it won't learn to won't learn to do anything good. If you train it on 500 at a time, it's being pulled in all different ways at once. So that's why I did this, and it um, worked quite well. And then getting the answers out, um, it just it was one file at a time, and it spits them out. And this is the other demo. Now this one is listening to the radio. Um, there are radio stations that are funded to speak a certain number of hours of Maori language um, per day, and if they're not funded, the people want to cut the funding off. Um, I mean, if they're not speaking that much, they want to they want to cut the funding off. And the people who actually have the job of listening to the radio, they don't want it anymore. Um, they want to be concentrating on the quality and, and not the counting minutes. So we made this machine. When it's down the bottom, um, it's music. Māori on that side, English on that side. Māori Party Branch Annual General Meeting. Ahuri the Māori Party Branch Annual General Meeting is being held on the 10th of September, 6 but 6. Aroha mai, 6. Sound like I'm Australian. Australian, 6 p.m. It's being held at 38 Richmond Street in Marae Nui. You can contact Anei Te Tahi o Namawaya. Kore ono waru ka toru rua. You can see it. That's not um, perfect. But, you know, it, it, it does well enough so that we told them it could do, um, you know, 95%, so like this, an hour a day, or half an hour a day or something, an hour a day, might be misclassified, but if it, so if it comes close, then they can examine it properly. Um, so this is t talking about how I pre process the audio. How many? How much time do I have? All right, I'll just skip. I'll, I'll stick on the on the overview. So, just taking the little windows and putting them through bins. Now, another as well as people, we also identified birds, um, and the humans. You feed it through a filter like that to kind of get the right um, coefficients, and then so here here audio. Classification lag. So now, if you ask the recurrent neural network to say what the language is speaking at the very instant that um, it hears it, it's got no time to think about its context. So you actually have a fraction of a second, maybe half a second of lag, so that it has a chance to. Um, consider what it's heard and take into account what followed it. Um, so th <laughs> where this purple bit of wave it's, it's thinking about over there and, it's, and what it's got in its mind is sort of like something going off possibly forever but it's like maybe one bit of information from a minute ago and a lot of bits from recent and the information from over here, it's just storing up for, for when it gets to it. Um, other people do speech recognition. Um, they're doing, getting quite good. They, they, people are using um, recurrent neural networks to label images. And they use um, GPU clusters and deep recurrent neural networks, which just means 
having more more layers above or below or both the recurrent layer or maybe having more than one recurrent layer and they use bidirectional ones where if, the, if you have an audio file you can go backwards in time and forwards in time at the same time and the, um, if you're doing continuous speech recognition you can't but they're always doing it in labs so they cheat um, and they use high level libraries but in the publisher on archive.org if you want to as a, as a field they research so fast that they never they can't ever wait for um, the journal so they, they all, everything you need to read about is there and that this is my code which I don't think anyone else is using which suits me because um, I can keep changing it um, and it's, it's C and a little bit of Python and GStreamer plugins and LGPL. That's about all. Thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you. Um, we have time for maybe one quick question. Um, otherwise, you will have to speak to Douglas yeah. afterwards. So if, if this software is just doing what you want it to do, uh, do you have other packages you could recommend for people who are just wanting to get started for the very first time, maybe? I haven't used any, but um, people do use Theano, and that uses a GPU. I've only, I don't have a GPU. I've got an Intel laptop from a few years ago, so it's, it's no point for me. Um, or Torch, which uses Lua. Theano is Python, and, the, and it, so they, the fast bits go uh, on the GPU. Yeah. Um, please move quietly when you're moving. We have one more question, and then we have to move on. Yeah. Um, yes. the, um, the speech recognition, or the, the Murray example you showed just then, I was just curious how many neurons you had for that uh, example. Yeah, um, I think 299 or 399. Okay. Um, so I always do multiple of four minus one because um, you, you, the ECC things work out better if you do that. <laughs> Okay, we do have to wrap up now. That was very interesting. Thank you. And yeah, thank you. <laughs>